the issues with business analysis and AI. I don't know if there are issues. I think it's a maturity thing. I Welcome to another discussion with Breakfast with Friends. Today's guest is Frank Kolkowski. Frank's been a friend for many years, and he's a leading expert in business performance, business analysis, data science, business intelligence, and many other areas and industries. Frank and I have had a number of conversations, some of which we're sharing in these, and we'll probably invite some friends along the way. Discussion for today delves into applying business analysis to improve artificial intelligence. I think you'll find the discussion interesting. We touch on a number of different topics, which span issues that data scientists are facing. I hope you'll enjoy this. So okay. you were just talking about the issues with business analysis and AI. I don't know if there are issues. I think it's a maturity thing, uh, business analysis. And uh, the way it relates to AI is that the analysis that goes into understanding how to apply AI to an organization, which we talked about in the last conversation, is where it comes into play. Right. Uh, in one of our training classes on business analysis, I asked the question, how many types of analysis are there? Just a general question. And I said, you have three or four minutes to create a list because everybody has individual tables. They are tables of four or five people. And I says, get a list for your table and then put them on the flip chart and then we'll talk about them. When we got done, in just five or 10 minutes, we had 31 or 32 different types of analysis. And they said wow. that they had exhausted the list. <laughs> everybody said that. They thought of more more that you could do. And, and I'll give you an example. And this goes back to some of the methodology things that you and I have talked about in the past uh -huh. on, on architecture and uh, business architecture, enterprise architecture, uh, structured methodologies for analyzing things. Uh, and what happens is within that, you have sets of analysis. You might have document analysis, process analysis, skills analysis. And when you start creating the list, you end up, you know, you have financial analysis and all these other types of analysis that you would do. And you get this really long list and what becomes... Well, so let me ask you a question. I mean, are they really different disciplines of analysis or are we applying the, uh, the, the information gathering and curation of uh, needs for different personas? I think the term you use, curate, is probably very accurate. That is a good word to use for this. Because basically, what I understand after about 30 years of doing stuff like this, is that you're curating a series of types of analysis depending on what the request was originally. For example, if someone wants to do process improvement, you're going to be doing a more focused type of analysis on processes and the process enablers. But if someone says, I need to find out if there's something going wrong in, in the organization, that's very general with no specific purpose in mind. And I've had this discussion in the past where people have told me, you cannot do requirements for anything unless you have a purpose. I says, well, no. Wait, so the, the, the term, the term purpose is interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that that, that, is, that is something that is fixed in people's mind right now, that without a purpose, you can't do requirements. I said, that's not true. Okay, so uh, I think that's actually an interesting idea there because usually if we're going to spend cycles, let's just say that we have to devote resource time towards doing some kind of analysis. And right. it's, it is taking time and it's, it, there's, there's some money that has to be spent. Oh, yeah, and it's usually um, expensive. Usually it's in the pursuit of some kind of demand. The demand might be, an issue that's happened in production, um, an opportunity that might be with, you know, growing the business um, or improved efficiencies of some kind in terms of reducing operational costs. Um, those are the typical drivers for those things. And of course, right. compliance. Um, now, what you said is interesting because I'd like you to probe into that a little bit more because I think there's an opportunity to gather, uh, I won't just say requirements as much as understand where there are needs across different personas. That's the way I think of it. And then you can do that as a bankable uh, inventory of opportunity, 
where you can either improve things for internal consumers or potentially external consumers. Yeah, the, the term I, I like to, I, I have more in favor nowadays is a term, we'd like to get some insights into your organization. And we use the term insights because when what you're doing is poking around, you're probing for something, but you don't have a particular purpose in mind. And purposes are everything from very specific, like I want to find out which documents are causing a problem, to something very general, very general, something's not going on right in the company, and I don't know what, or the organization. So that's, and I, I try to stay away from the term requirements because of the issues I've talked about before where people who do, who are business analysts today, think it's all about requirements for computer applications in a business. And it's not, that is a small, actually a small subset of the overall analysis that goes on in a business to do some of the things that you're talking about. How do I know I'm on track, for example, with where I should be going? Mm -hmm. And that's more of a monitoring and looking at function, and yet there's an analysis involved with that. And it has nothing to do with a specific purpose. You're probing for, uh, like SWAT does, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And people are saying, how do I know things? Here's one I got. How do I know things are going well? That's a good question. You know, am I, am I looking at the right, am I using the right uh, factors to manage my organization? Are these, is, is it a KPI issue like we talked about last time? You know, or is it some other, is it a return issue? I mean, I just, you know, executives oftentimes get a feeling something's wrong or not working right or could work better. And they can't really articulate it. And they feel they should be able to. And I said, why? Let's go take a look at some things that come to your mind, and then we'll start analyzing and see if something shows up. And usually something does show up. Maybe not what they anticipated, but something does show up. So let, let me uh, go back to what you were saying initially. Normally, people don't want to, companies don't want to pay for people to just poke around. There's right. usually something called a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's the stem for an investigation, uh, bringing in a third party, doing some quote unquote analysis, uh, doing analysis for no reason usually doesn't go very far. No, it's like research, you know, and right. they don't want to spend money for something like that because they don't understand yet what they're going to get from it. You which know, is, which is a, gonna, if they don't know what they're going to get. more of an exploratory with a problem in mind, uh, which is a whole different realm of discussion because it biases the results, which is the antithesis of scientific yes. research. But yes, that's right. Now, here's something interesting. What, what I've noticed over the years is that the people who actually do this are not in the organizations, are not in the businesses. They're, you know, what they're doing is there's maybe a government-sponsored study or a university study by a professor. Somebody picks it up in an organization, says, "I want to find out about whatever this is, the sex thing." So now they have a purpose. Okay. And they can go from very general analysis to very specific analysis to find out whether there's an opportunity for them. But at least for a funding standpoint, particularly, it's focused enough to get approvals. Let and me ask you a question. Point. Yeah. Um, you opened up with AI before. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, I look at the people that are doing AI, they have a title called data scientist. Now, the, there, there is scientific analysis that's involved with the development of the models. If the data scientist is applying scientific method, are they trying to look for patterns to solve a business problem, you know, so I'm trying to improve a smoothing analysis for pricing and, or I'm trying to understand why customer attrition is increasing or whether or not there is a price sensitivity problem with one or more of the services I'm offering. Now, if we apply the scientific method, we're not necessarily trying to solve a given problem, but we're trying to understand how various patterns may influence a problem. Right. So if we're using, let's just say, techniques of Agile and applying that to the scientific method, and we're trying to solve a specific problem that the business has identified, um, 
how does that introduce a bias? Not necessarily something in terms of uh, something that goes against diversification or ethics, but just biasing the patterns that we're actually trying to build into the model to support the problem and doing it in an agile manner rather than applying the true scientific method, which doesn't always lend itself to a right. Well, you bring up, this is an interesting point because it brings up the difference between bias in an algorithm and a bias in a data. These are two different things. An algorithm can be biased because of the focus. And when you when you decide on the drivers of the, your target, that's where you're introducing algorithmic bias. And algorithmic bias is a little harder to get rid of than data bias. bias. You can right, see the right, data right. bias, but right. it's hard to see algorithmic bias. And you know this by what drivers you put in a driver diagram. See, when, when we use driver diagrams or influence diagrams to identify uh, the, the things that influence a particular target you're interested in. You've One of you started introducing the bias when you select the target, that starts the bias. Then that's gonna drive the bias of everything that drives that target. Mm -hmm. now, the, the list that you gave me was interesting because it's interesting because most of them, when you were going through your list, I was thinking of all the external influences from an organization that those involve. I didn't once think of anything internal. Right. Not once which is interesting because this is where we get most of our queries now. They want to know what's going on in the external environment. They said, you know, our sales into this age group are dropping. What's going on? That's the question they seriously that they'll ask. So they're looking, they, they start what, looking at what? Demographics, what's happening to their demographics? You know, and then they say, well, it's not just a demographic, demographics, there may be some social change going on because we notice activity in a different age, age group picking up. Well, how is that? So when they analyze their sales, they say, okay, all of a sudden we're selling into the over 65 group and not into the 2030 group. How is that even possible <laughs> you know, to do that? And it is, it, it is possible, but you have to find out what the drivers are. And so it's very hard to get funding sometimes to do stuff like this internally, to take a look at that because it's not real clear what the output's gonna be. However, if you can count it to say, we need to discriminate where the market is moving Okay, and find out what market we're going to address, and if the products and services we offer fit that market, and then that means a change. And something came up interesting actually this morning as I was uh, thinking about this. It has to do with the rate of change in the external environment. If you think back like 50 or 60 years ago or more, and you were going to do telco, for example, it took 30 years or more to do a build out. So if you're a company that's under duress, you have literally 30 years to figure out what the, what's going on. Now this happens in three to five years. You don't have that time frame anymore. Right. This has changed the need to be good at doing this analysis very dramatically. You can't take your time and watch and wait for things to develop. You have to be more proactive in anticipating things. And, it, and it's hard to do that. It's not that easy to do that. So that's a very interesting statement. Everybody wants to be more proactive um, a lot of times we're falling back on agile methodologies because we don't know how to um, we don't know how to sense change outside of the organization. We often struggle, companies often struggle with just sensing changes that are going on in the organization. Um, and like one of the biggest changes is culture and how culture, of course, influences that thing called tragedy. Right. And part of the problem is uh, if you're not aligned with your communications, your culture is not going to be aligned with ena enabling that strategy, but they don't have a good way to probe it. And they often ask very safe questions to ensure that they're actually on the right track, which biases mm -hmm. the results. Yep. Now, that's a sensory uh, bias internally what do the companies need to do to create, well, more of a scientific approach for how they understand the sensory input internally and externally to address the points you just made? Because to be proactive, you have to be able to sense what's going on. If I can't sense that my hand is going to catch fire because I'm close to the stove, I'm going to have a problem in about five minutes. Yes. 
Yeah, I remember some time back, uh, it was an organization, a very large service organization, and they wanted to become more proactive. I said, okay, then what you have to do is go to all the vendors of the products you service and have them tell you exactly when they're going to fail. That on Tuesday, this item will fail, then we can be proactive and plan for it. And it took two seconds for them to realize that this was not, not reliable. So what you need to do is develop a rapid response approach in your reactive mode. That will improve your performance. And they thought about that quite a bit because they said you cannot really be proactive except in certain aspects. Like I can be proactive in how fast I respond. I can do stuff like that. And, and they did. They started looking at it that way. It's like, they said, tell me exactly when my television is going to fail so I can schedule the repair person or I can schedule getting a new one. All right. So that works fine from an operational perspective. And that's sort of what some of the work that um i've done in some other organizations with you know things like digital twins and yeah, to create exactly. some of that operational awareness about failure yeah. mode and all that but when it comes to business i mean swot analysis porters i mean we're seeing disruption happening on a regular basis so yeah. by the time you figure it out with porters you've already had your lunch eaten mm -hmm. and taken away and you're chasing, you know, the next thing. So, where do they do? Where do they go with strategy um, to create that kind of agility to respond more rapidly to business and environmental changes? Yeah, that's that's a good question. There, there, there's two points to that. Uh, one of them is how do you understand the external environment outside the uh, organization, regardless of the kind. It doesn't make a difference with a government organization or a for-profit business, nonprofit, or an ethnic group or whatever that you have. Uh, you have the same issue. The same issue comes up is how do I anticipate stuff? And the type of inquiries I've been getting uh, more recently, mostly before the pandemic started, but uh, they had to do with how do I understand the external environment? Well, we talked a lot about using PESTLE because it's one of the better approaches to do that. You know, looking at different aspects of the external environment political, oh. environmental, technology, so on. Right. So now the PESTLE analysis is something that, you know, I don't, I don't know if you have an example of that or not, but I think it's something that a lot of people, I don't see that brought up in most organizations. No, what I see at the last conference, when I was speaking at the conference last September, is myself and three other speakers brought up PESTLE. I believe we were the only ones who actually showed how you use it. That is, what analytics do you apply how do you know that this social impact is being driven by technology or vice versa, that the technology is driving a social impact? Because you have to know that to be able to determine whether you're going to service a particular uh, segment of the society with your products and services. And I showed how you do that. None of the other speakers showed that. They just said, here's Pestle. You can use Pestle. They went on. Now, I don't know why they didn't show that. We went into detail of how you do this in a talk we were giving. But I, I have seen this before that there's a lot of discussion about use. And PESTLE is very good, by the way. That approach is quite good. Right. And there's been other ones like trying to use input-output models and stuff like that, which are horrendous and hard to work with. They're huge. The, the input-output models are enormous. Right. And so they're right. hard to work with for characterizing the external environment. The fact that they broke it up and categorized it. Now, we extended PESTLE. You know, PESTLE, P-E-S-T-L-E, has just those components. We added two components to that markets, which are really important to most organizations. And what we, and the B stands for, and we say PESTLE MB. MB. M is for markets and B is for business interest. That means out of the surveys that are done every year with executives, which things have come to the top that is of most interest? Because most companies are trying to put something in place to deal with it. And we found out that that is probably one of the more insightful groupings of 20 or 30 things that we had on the external environment because that relates then to the social, the social, technological, political, and so on, all the other environments. So you have to have analytics for understanding first the external environment. Then you have to be able to link that to your strategy. That's what we call strategic alignment. So now all the work that's being done now with AI and now you know multivariate analysis and just the sheer number of variables, um, how are companies able to create this more proactive analysis using all the different kinds of variables uh, and make sense of them, not only individually, 
but in that term that we used before, which is correlation, mm -hmm. so that we don't end up with, uh, well, as you've often ta talked about, spurious results. Yeah, spurious results. Uh, I'm reminded of the uh, pharmaceutical project uh, that you and I were involved with at one time. And I had created models for them for the, the drug they were developing, not drug, but the product they were developing. And uh, towards the end of the project of my involvement, they came in and said, the whole market's changed. We're not going for market X. We now have to go for market Y. Do we have to do everything you did over again? I said, no, all you have to do is change the data set and a few of the influences. And I can tell you which ones. I said, and that's where a digital twin is really important mm -hmm. because I had a digital twin of their decision-making and they could see where the, which factors influence most the markets they were going into. Right. You know, yeah. So, and that became very important because I said, if we go, if we choose a different set of markets and a different usage of the product that we have, then we have to do this all over again. No, you only have to adjust the model to, to accommodate it. And that is the value of a model of a digital twin. Right. But I don't know how many executives really understand that, that part of it. Well, it's interesting because um, a number of folks that I've talked with in, you know, uh, some of them in the Digital Twin Consortium, uh, some in the Knowledge Graph space and others, they're all trying to figure out, um, you know, this, uh, the, what are the influencers, mm -hmm. right? Um how do they know the uh, the amount of emphasis to put on any one or combination uh, yeah. of mm -hmm. factors? And how do they know that that's accurate? Um, and then how do they apply scale to it? Because you mentioned something earlier about demographics. If mm -hmm. I apply the same set of factors across all demographics, I know I won't understand why customers are leaving or why they're switching or why some are jumping on my service at 65 and over versus the younger group, because there are other pieces of context that have to be associated with that. Yeah. And one of the challenges with analysis that I've seen over the years is the lack of binding the context, the facts that they uncover with, um, you know, the um, scenario. Because it's very much situational. And more and more, we're seeing people making decisions based on a number of pieces of context and the given scenario that they're dealing with. That level of understanding yeah. uh -huh. is not understood it's very much um abstracted and so we don't really know why things happen we can sort of say well it looks like these different and then we get into you know it may be right for one small segment but it can't be applied generally how right. do we address those kinds of challenges at scale oh my gosh almost a spoiler alert we do teach stuff like this uh, here's an example Let's say you have a decision structure and there are decision tools to do the analyze the structure, which we've used. You know, you and I both are using these things. And you have these, the driver diagram, which are your factors that drive that target. But what I realized sometime back, you know, a huge time ago, like 20 minutes, um, was that uh, if you have a neural net that analyzed some history on those factors, you can find out which are the influence ones have the most impact. Once you know that, then you can manipulate the decision model to figure out what the optimal decision structure would be. So you use, we call this composite algorithms, mm -hmm. being able to take algorithms from totally different disciplines and connect them some way. And this is one way to do that. We just recently did this with correlation analysis, with a correlation matrix and neural nets. And you come up with a four box and then you determine a strategy for each of your boxes. Right. That helps the management. Is it perfect? Does it give you 100? No, nothing will do that. But it improves your decision-making dramatically. And we're very interested in improving the productivity of managers today because a lot of work is being done. We have creeping AI into the management ranks. Yeah, if you, if you take a look at it, you'll find out that all of a sudden these areas which we thought that, that they weren't much of an impact, 
all of a sudden robotics are appearing and things like that. Like the one that uh, Boston's uh, Dynamics shows with the robot who can carry tools up to somebody working on a platform. And and we never thought you would have robots like that within this near future, but you do right. have them. And there's other AI like this that's coming up, like in construction, in mapping out how you remodel a building. There's little devices that go around and map out the whole floor, draw it. And instead of taking four to six months, it takes two weeks. This is, a, now you're creeping into the expertise area. Or you, if you take a look at Dali with the art and stuff like that, right. you see the, the beginning. Okay, it's just at the beginning. It's like, okay. So, so that's that's very interesting it's because happening. the term expertise um, has a number of different flavors to it. One is um, the knowledge of, let's say, technique and discipline, mm -hmm. the application of technique and discipline within, let's just say, um, standards and constraints um, in a number of different scenarios is what lends levels of expertise. Mm -hmm. Knowing those patterns are out there, and many of them are documented. Policy, yep. constraints, many of yep. these things are captured in document form, but there's more and more work that's being done where they're starting to model policy constraints. Um, certainly we can do that in manufacturing and certainly in military yeah. environments, especially. Well, especially in government because they have yeah. data that every time they make policy decisions, they then get two to four years of data until the next group takes over or whatever happens. Right. And now you've got a whole bunch of data that you can use to drive a neural net, for example, to find out where the influences are. So if that's the case, wow. if that's the case, and you mentioned creeping AI, into decision making. Yeah. How is it that we don't make better decisions in companies? Because like so many times you see investments in companies and they all I mean there there aren't any projects that are ever uh that don't have a you know a, a positive IRR or certainly uh return on investment. But, I mean otherwise it wouldn't get funded of course. Right. Now in theory, all of those investments should re should yield a certain amount of impact on the organization's overall performance and or growth and or margins. So those are the three factors. Um, I'm separate from compliance to staying in business. So where is the ability to impact decision makers augment their capabilities without necessarily displacing them so that when decisions are made, especially with prioritization, because there's so many things that you could change. And part of the problem is we're making decisions aren't just whether or not to fund, but whether or not to even put something in the hopper to get funded and then as you're going through it you're many you're making many decisions along the way yes how do we improve decision making throughout life cycle change and organizational change and then of course you know quote unquote transformation yeah this is this is a really good point we spent some time looking at this over the last several years and one of the things that we realized is that when you have tools that are supposed to help managers you know, for example, the 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 still the most common consulting tool suite is called Office. Yeah, it still is. It has been for years. They've studied this time and again, and it keeps coming out as the number one tool. And the question I ask myself is, why aren't consultants using additional tools? And the reason is, most of the time they're not there. They're using the tools that they that people are proposing. You almost need a data scientist to handle them. So that's not a manager tool. If you need a data scientist, this is not a tool that a manager, manager can use the results, but now, now you gotta pay somebody outrageous amounts of money to run it. Okay, here's what happens. So you say, we need to have tools that are very easy for a manager to use. It's as easy as Office. Office is pretty easy to use today. You need management tools that have analytics and the analytics are very easy to use. And you don't, unless you're doing certain types of analysis, like for customers, how many customers you have or prospects you have, and you need billions of rows, or facial recognition or something, you generally don't need a lot of rows. 
500 or 1,000 rows is more than enough to make a, to see if your model's gonna work. Just that's what you really wanna know. And if you can improve the decision-making four, five, or 6%, that drops to your bottom line. So, so let me go back to something you said earlier. You mentioned the need, you know, the, the use of PESL and other things to support some of that twining, twinning of yes. decision-making. Okay, which I totally agree with that ability to do simulation. What ifs, if you will. What if stuff, yes. Now, the, you can't do what if very easily in PowerPoint. <laughs> it's a no, static but you picture. In Excel, but it's all quantitative oriented. What happens if you have to introduce, for example, semantic analysis somewhere? Well, all of a sudden you're stuck. Right. You need a tool that can integrate those. Yep. So that's where knowledge graphs and ontology can come into play, but most organizations right. have not. And you can't do certain quantitative things with those now. Right. This is this is what we run into constantly. Okay, it's great here, it's great there. Then you find out you need five tools to do this. And then they come back and they say, well, who's integrating these five tools or how do we get them to work in a common manner? So that's a great point, which yeah. is another topic because now we get into the topic of uh, integration and interoperability. Designing for interoperability and integration in concept, yeah, we stitching things together using code, but that's not the same thing as true simulation capabilities. Right. That's actually systems of systems design and systems engineering, which is very few companies, you know, their corporate IT environments, they're not given the time to invest in those. And to do that, I think you need a certain amount of... Um, uh, what's that term we started with, analysis? Yeah. Well, but this is a good point you bring up because what, what we are missing is when we do certain amount analysis now, we produce reams of documentation. And the input I get, and it's a lot of it, actually. It's not just a little bit of input. It's from people who are practitioners as well as clients. They said, there's nothing to do analytics with that documentation. How do we do the analytics? And, and we know because we've been doing this for years. And I said, okay, well, then there are some tools available now coming out to the market that can do things like that. But this is not a tool discussion. The issue that we have is how do you support the business analyst with the proper tools to do good analysis and then turn these over to the manager to use? Okay, I get pushback on that. And the pushback comes generally from service firms. I said, we don't want to give that to the managers. They don't need us then. Yeah, well, that's the point. They'll have another problem. They have them let them call you up when they have problems or issues, instead of you know to run a tool. This is the the classic story about the fishermen. You know, you teach them to to fish and they support themselves as opposed to you know giving them the fish. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You teach them how to do the analytics and you teach them how to use the tools. They can do that and they will move on to the next thing and they'll come back to you as a service organization, which which I've got that experience, lots of it. So that's interesting because. A lot of times what I have seen is service organizations will produce, you know, um, analysis, mm -hmm. guidance, where that's born from, how they came up with it is something of a black box. I don't know how many companies actually delve into the black box, understand how they got there. Right. Most of the time it's, uh, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint discussion. OK, yes. that's been distilled into just a few slides because. Unfortunately, we the classic we, 20,000 foot view. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so how do, so there's a certain amount of insulation that's. You know, uh, that's part of the consultative environment, and it's fostered by executives and or those that uh, hand uh curate information that's fed to executives so that they are not overwhelmed and the so part of the problem is that distillation is loses some of that fidelity yes exactly you lose a lot of fidelity when you do that you can get to the 20,000 foot view but you've lost the majority of the fidelity Right, And they want to boil down to what is the one factor or the two things that I should be looking at or how can I right. fix this one or two things. And sometimes it's not that simple. You know, if it were that simple, you wouldn't have all these different characteristics and facial recognition. You have hundreds of them. So this gets back to uh, something that uh, 
uh, a colleague from the uh, from Benkozy, uh David Long mentioned the issue of simplicity versus simplification. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the concerns with a lot of the analysis is that um, we really don't understand how all of this information is related. We just trust certain individuals to bring us the right information. And with some simplistic probing, the idea is that, okay, well, we feel our gut level says this is something that we can understand and we can we can and we can appreciate and then we can make a decision upon as opposed to you know having the right tool set where you can actually start to understand cause and effect with the more of a white box understanding without getting into the the complexity. Yeah, it's why I think a lot of managers like heat maps. Heat maps, they'll take a bunch of detailed data, like 40 or 50 points, and then highlight them by color. So then you have a heat map of the data. So now you know that you have, a, you have a, you, at one time you see that you have a larger set of results, but you have a core set that fits some criteria. Right. And if you can get a slider on that criteria, you can watch the red expand or contract. And that, and that in two seconds, the manager's got an understanding of what's going on, mm -hmm. just like that. And that's what we're missing. It's tools that can do simple things like that and give the manager a chance to vary the parameters real quickly and take a look at something. They just There's just not many that exist that way to do that. There are a few tools out there, but they're not many. And then to be able to integrate that across sets of data and stuff, that is not common either. Or be able to, to take the same data like we've done with neural nets and correlation matrices and decision structures and say, if the underlying data looks like this, then you can use all three and you get different results from all three. You integrate it together, you can make a decision. So one of the things I see missing is something that we talked about earlier. When we do analysis, we gather inputs from a number of different sources. Okay. Um, we, you know, and we'll, we'll typically like look at, let's say personas, outcomes, uh, functions, features, and so forth and or diagnostics from issues and, and of course, uh, constraints uh, from uh, compliance. Um, and, you know, there's other things that come into play, but it all gets, you know, somehow homogenized and put into projects. And most of the analysis is on the operational without understanding how all that demand came to be and how yeah. to synthesize that so that we understand that sensory input rather than this is what we're doing. How do we, how do we make that bridge happen between, you know, the sensory portion, which is not articulated in data, it's in document. Right, okay. Exactly. And so you you're missing all of that to really drive the sliders properly. Yeah, that that because we've looked at this problem probably for over 20 years, this issue. It's, just, it's not really a problem. It's more of an issue of how you get sliders, all the way from, you know, sliders that show you asset changes when you make a decision, asset A changes to asset B, changes to asset C. Like, you know, you have money, you change, convert that equipment. Later on, you sell the equipment, the equipment produces revenue. And so you have asset interchanges. We did sliders like that. People had trouble understanding its use. They, first of all, they realized they didn't understand asset interchanges. <laughs> this is what happened. Right. right. It, it was totally, you know, your managers, senior managers, you need to understand asset changes. They didn't understand that. I assumed that they knew stuff like this. Dangerous on our part to assume that people know this or we know something for sure. You know, so the assumption of knowledge is a question uh, on either our part doing the analysis uh, on what to look for and on the part of the management who thinks they understand everything that's going on in the company. No, so, 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 all right. This is a real area of opportunity. Well, it's something we can probe into our next conversation, but um, with the growing complexity out there and the need for this ongoing uh, simplicity for making decisions, we need to go from the simplicity of it to understanding how to connect the dots. So mm -hmm. companies are trying to play around with 
let's say, knowledge graphs as an example. But I don't see too many companies that are understanding how to connect the dots from the in the intake, the demand portion, right, and bring that into the operational and understand how the you know the sliders can be influenced by the external factors, the internal factors, not just from an operational perspective, but also from a strategic perspective, like you were saying before. And there's something there that you touched upon around yeah. management skill sets. It isn't just around tools. Right. It's understanding some of the causal factors and the layers around that, which is far more complex now than it used to be. Yeah, this this is a good point to bring up because the technique, we use a technique obviously for this, and it's called alignment. And this has come up a lot the last five or six years in, in publications. They talk about alignment in the business, aligning your strategies with your operations and so on. And we've done a lot of work in that area. That's kind of one of the areas that we work in. And it's not an easy area to work in. But what happens is you have layers of management, obviously, and they understand their layer pretty well. What they don't understand is the linkages up and down or across even, how you do this across. And again, this was one of the topics in the talk I did in London, was how do you connect what, you're, what you see in the external environment to the strategies and then connect that to your tactics and then connect that to your operations. And if something changes in the external environment, what does it impact? But here's the other side of this, which I, I worked on probably for the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, it says, well, what happens if you start implementing a technology change in your operations? What does that do to your strategies and your tactics and so on? So you need a reverse impact. And I gave a talk years ago called, it was had to do with architecture with uh, uh, John Zachman's framework. Mm -hmm. And I go with row three squeeze. It says you have changes that are coming from external and you have changes going on in your operations, like with robotics and stuff like that. In the middle, you have the structure of your enterprise, the tactical part, and you're wondering what's going on because it's being squeezed from both ends. And I was talking about what can you do to rec a, recognize it and two, put a plan in action to deal with it because you know they could, they could not be aligned necessarily. You could be doing something that doesn't fit at all with the, with the direction of what's happening outside the organization. And that's where there becomes an issue. And but I, this I gets us doesn't address. You hear more about it now, right? Doesn't that get us back to um, the need for some of this creeping AI? Yes, and at the same time, more uh, better tools for agile decision making rather yes. than agile reactionary. Yeah, that's a good. And calling it agile decision making is good because it doesn't take away from the fidelity. Right. It doesn't take away from the fidelity at all. It says you need to have good input and you need to be able to manipulate that input to get a better decision. You need to do be able to do that in a very simple manner. So let me ask a question about something that you touched on earlier. You said early on when you when let's say company or an executive approached you and said, Hey, something doesn't feel right. Can you look into this? And you and which suggests that they struggle with some of the KPIs or things that we call measures. Do we have yeah. the right measures? Mm -hmm. How do you know you have the right measures? Oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a thing called data and yeah. trust. They're trying to do trust with algorithms, with you know modified yeah. you know success, but trust and data is only part of it. Where do we get the trust in the algorithms and in the decision making and in the measurement? Are we measuring the right things, even if it's even if the measure is proper and it's been approved and the calculation of the inputs are all good? If they're using it the wrong way to make a decision, then there's a problem with the trust of the decision, which again, yes. it can get into cascading problems, but how do we start to get our arms around that? And where can analysis, business analysis, come into play to help improve that? Well, you know, again, this is another good point. Uh, some time ago, I was meeting with a colleague of mine who was a, a very high level in an organization, and we were chatting about business intelligence, okay, amongst other things, and performance management, the difference between them. 
And one of the things I said, well, how much money are you spending per year if you want to bring a new factor into your business intelligence system? He says, about $100 million. I said, how many factors are you looking at? He says, close to 100, costs about a million dollars to evaluate each one. Well, this is a lot of money, okay. And, uh, and I said, well, how many of them make it into the BI system? He says, less than 10%. I said, well, what if you could find out whether that measure was interesting enough to put it to the BI system, because it takes a long time to get its format and everything right across the whole company, you know, what, what a BI issue is. And he says, yeah, if you could say, do that, we would save a ton of money. I said, well, a performance management system can tell you whether that performance measure is significant within a couple of weeks. If it's mm -hmm. significant, then you move it to the BI next stage. If it's not significant, you drop it back and monitor it. And it doesn't cost you much to do that. He says, we would save $90 million a year doing this. So this goes back to our impact assessment before when we said, yes. Yes. which of these factors are influencing my price sensitivity, my That's right. performance, exactly. the same kinds of discussions. And so this kind of takes us the round trip. Well, and the nice thing is, since I've had that discussion, which is like five or six years ago, the capabilities to do this have improved, to do stuff like this, especially with AI, because now you can find out impact as well as correlation and stuff like that. Uh, it's not enough just to know that things correlate with each other. You have to know if they are significant or not. I've asked executives, how do you know that the factors that you use to manage your organization are still valid? You've been using them for 20 years. What makes them still valid? Because you're making major decisions based on these inputs. And most of them don't have an answer. Unfortunately, you do this in private with them. You don't do it in the public forum. <laughs> right, right. But then doesn't that suggest that they struggle with complexity and they're insulated yeah. by, let's just say, um, uh, indulgent uh, lower executives that know that this is what, they're comfortable with. And this gets us to a quality of management and executives, which is the struggle with uncertainty. Yeah, it reminds me of the, the movie Barbarians at the Gate, where the executives are saying, take the comments about the rat results out. He doesn't like to read about rats. And that was key <laughs> to, to the investigation. Right, right. <laughs> And on, and on that did, note, oh my gosh! You know? <laughs> and on that note, it's a good one to uh, close this one conversation off. Um, we'll uh, we'll continue. We opened up the thread for a, a number of things, but I'd like to probe into um, a couple of the topics that we touched on, uh, especially the one uh, around uncertainty and how we can get better tools uh, and awareness around complexity without overwhelming um you know decision makers yeah you can't overwhelm an, a, a manager or an executive senior executive with tons of data you right. have to you have to be able to filter it and, and and find out what is significant to them and give them the opportunity remember years ago decision support systems were supposed to do that but they they, they never achieved that what happened is the executive turned it over to their staff and then the executive right. would tell the staff and then now you lost fidelity immediately Right. In, the, in what you were doing. It has to be such that the executive likes to do this. It has to be fun for them almost to do it. Mm -hmm. And when we've talked about uh, like software products for this to say, it's got to be easy to use. It has to have a wow factor. That is, the graphics have to look really neat. And it has to have value to them. It has to be really easy to use and they can make a decision quick. Those are factors that I look at when I look at products that managers use. And, uh, and I find that if you have those factors, the manager will like to use that product. Most people will actually use right. the product. So there's cascading levels of management, understanding, and yes. detail and complexity. One of the things I have not seen is other than through uh, the, uh, the, the layered budgeting process is decision-making capabilities Again, they can be they can be um, genericized to some extent at the top level without focusing on just the same fifteen factors, mm -hmm. right? But there's also a need to bring the decision making down in a cascading fashion so people understand what the impacts are at their different levels, 
not unlike what we try to do with IoT. You can't make a decision within one domain without affecting other domains. Yeah. And so that's part of the domain analysis and you know exactly. reflective actions that have to take place. So the twinning of decision making is almost as important as the twinning of the, you know, the data and the processes and how we understand how impact flows through the organization from the externally and the internal. Yeah, we ran into an interesting situation. I, I'll close my comments on this one. This was a budgeting request. Now, you know, budgeting is really a mundane thing. Now, not everybody's interested. In I says, what is it you want to do with budgeting? He says, well, you know, we have budgets that have excess money and budget that are short because things happen. What we want to do is reallocate before the end of the year to see where we really stand. So we want to take money from an excess budget, move it to this budget, but we don't know where all these things are. Can you help us find out? And we did that. And so at the end of the year, they have one day where they run this, they run this analysis, and then they move the budgeting stuff around so they don't lose their budgets for next year, which I thought was kind of interesting. Right. <laughs> now this was a, this manager was really swift who wanted to do this. I mean, he was really a smart guy, and uh, I thought that was pretty clever. And he says he says. We can be over under overall budget, but I want to make sure that the budgets are captured in the right places and that we know next year what we need for that particular budget. And I don't want something to be punished because it was way over budget. Right. That's actually something that I've um, discussed in a couple of organizations is helping them with what they what I call liquid budgeting. It isn't yeah, uh, it isn't it isn't a staggered <laughs> thing. It's a continual flow of decision a making budget. responsing. <laughs> exactly. And that gets us towards more agile decision making but that's usually where the bottleneck takes place to yeah. move things around and reallocate that's right some organizations you can't do that in this particular right. actually it's a government organization not in the u.s yeah. it was overseas and they said we have the permission to go ahead and move stuff between budgets and account for it and in the next budget cycle make sure you have enough for the one that fell short that sort of thing right it's not a punishment issue exactly yep not a punishment issue all right Frank, good conversation as always. Great talking we'll to you again. as usual.